Coming up on SPNN Forum, Matt Ealing with Public Record Media. So, Matt Ealing, uh, welcome to the SPNN Forum. Thanks, Tom. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for the invite. Uh, glad to have you here. So, um, it, you, you have an interesting uh, sideline that you're involved with, Public Record Media, which is an organization that you describe as a mission to pursue transparency and democracy through the use, application, and enforcement of freedom of information laws. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty robust mission. So, I um, wanted to talk with you today about um, how this came about, uh, sort of the history of public record media, and what you do. So uh, I guess first off, this is not your this is not your full time job, but kind of a, a a passion of yours that you do spend a lot of time with. So talk a little bit about your background, what you do, and then how this came about. Oh sure. So I work uh, full time in the uh, uh, te television and communications industry, um, and uh, I've had an interest in public records. Uh, as a sideline for a long time. It came out of uh, working on broadcast documentaries, doing research, and learning how to use the tools of the Freedom of Information Act uh, and other open records laws. And uh, around about 2009, um, I was looking around at the media landscape here in town specifically and talking to people I knew in the media business. And there was uh, a little bit of a vacuum created uh, in the public record legal landscape, um, specifically because the internet had been cutting into uh, the profit margins for uh, the newspaper business, mm -hmm. and the newspapers have traditionally been uh, the entities that have gone to court to right. uphold public records laws and do the litigation. Um, and so I thought there, there was a little bit of a vacuum uh, and a gap that needed filling. And so that was the genesis of the idea for having an organization that would uh, make record requests uh, publish the data, uh, and also get involved in, in court activities, litigation as, as needed. Um, you know, we're a small organization. Uh, I'm a volunteer. I do this as a volunteer. Um, you know, I contribute my own money to the organization. Right. Uh, our other board members pitch in, and we've got a, a small number of small dollar donors, and we occasionally get some grants. Um, but uh, it's, it's largely volunteer driven. Uh, we have a couple of contract attorneys that we work with who give us um, some some nice discounts to be able to, to do the work. Um, and uh, we have been for the last almost 10 years now in the business of, uh, of filing records requests about all kinds of different topics that would be of interest to the general public uh, and then publishing the raw data up online when we get it. Um, so it's one thing to recognize there's a, a void, but quite another to, to really take, uh, to pursue that passion. So. Um, when you were, when you were, what what sort of got you that I'm going to somehow find a way to make to do this, even though you've got this, you know, full time work as a filmmaker, documentarian. Um, how did you think this was all going to come together? Has it has it come together the way you expected, or because um, it's pretty daunting to say I'm going to take on this pretty large to fill this pretty large gap. Well, it's it's uh, the idea has. Um transitioned a little bit over the last 10 years. So the initial idea uh, also involved a media component. Uh, the idea being that we'd use the public records request to generate story ideas that would then feed a, uh, a sort of semi-regular public affairs documentary program. Sure. And we shot a pilot um, and uh, had been talking to you know, various media outlets to see if it would be feasible to bring it forward. But uh, the, the, the amount of funding needed for that just wasn't. Uh, so uh, would you describe that as sort of a local 60 minutes type approach maybe for a, a parallel? That was that what we were thinking. Had, okay. Yeah. Is that, is that still a possibility that you're, or have you we've pitched that idea? Yeah, we've kind of moved uh, beyond that, uh, mostly for reasons of funding. Sure. Um, and so after we sort of set that part of it aside, uh, then we eventually transitioned the organization into a nonprofit organization okay. um, a few years ago. Uh, one of the attorneys that we worked with had been a big advocate for that, and, and his vision, um, I think, has, has really borne fruit. Um, and so the, the missions now are, are to acquire public information through government records requests, publish the raw data, 
uh, to write stories based on that data that go up on our website. And uh, Mike Kazuba, who used to work for the Star Tribune, right. has come on board with us uh, to sort of do the, the, the bulk of the journalism component. So how much time would you say that uh, it requires you to devote to this each week? I'm just It's curious. probably 10 to 15 hours a week. Okay, yeah. because I think, I think the general public doesn't always appreciate that when uh, they see the end result, but they don't always realize the amount of commitment it takes to have what's really a sideline. I mean, it, I, I don't want to call it a hobby because it's, it's more serious than a hobby, but the fact that um, it takes that kind of devotion on top of your regular work um, usually scares most people away um, from taking <laughs> right. on those things. So the fact that you're committed to it is really heartening that something like this has come about. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, so, people, so our audience can get, a, get an idea of the kinds of things, because you talk about public records access, it seems sort of vague, but you're actually tackling um, quite a number of, uh, of, you know, in my view, interesting stories. When you look at, um, you know, just on your website, uh, what's up there right now, um, there are articles about, uh, that you describe Minnesota Medicaid controversy, um, talking about uh, Union Depot hosting a party for the Vikings in the Super Bowl, um, a Tesla crash in Minnesota, um, a lawsuit that you filed against the Justice Department, which we will get to in a minute, and then a longtime activist, Marv Davidoff, and the FBI, and, and J. Edgar Hoover. So first of all, how do you decide what, which stories that you pursue? So it's a combination of uh, uh, my own input into records requests, uh, Mike Kazuba, who uh, is our, you know, our editor on the journalism piece of this. He also puts in records requests uh, completely at his own discretion. Uh, and then we look to our board uh, every quarter when we meet for recommendations on what they want to pursue as well. Um, and that's, that's primarily where it comes from. So occasionally we'll get people who call in uh, and are curious about something. Sure. And if we feel like it's a, a worthy topic to take on, we'll, we'll do that as well. Is, it, is, it all, is there also a function of whether you think a particular issue is getting the necessary media scrutiny? Um, we, t we take that into account. Um, Sometimes we'll see something that, that comes out as a story in another press outlet that we think could be dug into further. Um, and and that, that's one of the things that is a reality of the media business now is that it's hard to do long form follow up investigative journalism. Um, I mean, there's, there's still good work being done like that, but right. not every story can. And you know, that's something that you're able to do because with volunteers and your own time and others. Yeah, and that's because of the, the, there's a lag time for getting these government records, and often uh, it's not on the, uh, the news cycle that a, a major media outlet uh, really can contend with. So let's, uh, let's talk about that first, uh, um, in the actual gathering of the information. Talk a little bit about the process, what you have to do, and what you face in challenges in terms of how quickly the agencies or local governments provide you with the information you're seeking. Uh, we do a lot of federal requests, and we also do a lot of state of Minnesota-based requests, and some other states as well. Um, for the federal government, you have uh, essentially a 20-day time frame under law for them to respond to you. In reality, they never do that. Um, so you're always uh, backlogged on the federal side. Um, uh, sometimes to break the backlog, you've got to file in court, which we've done before. Um, and we're in the middle of one of those suits right now. Uh, on the state of Minnesota side, uh, it it varies depending on the agency and the city or the municipality or county you know, agency you're dealing with, state agency. It uh, depends on how uh, busy they are. And also under Minnesota law, there's kind of a floating time frame. What would you say is the typical response from the time you file a, 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 a it's actually a data practices request usually, right, rather than a freedom of information request. That's right, yeah. And you can explain real quickly the difference of that, because I don't want to get into too much of the minutia, but oh, sure. um, when, the, when you file a request with the state, how, in principle, how, how, how long does it generally take to get the information you're seeking? Uh, it can take anywhere from, uh, for a, from a couple of months uh, to a year. Now, it depends on uh, how much priority we are putting on it as an organization. Right. Um, so putting a story together is not a, it, it, it requires a, a pretty large, it, it can require a pretty large time window. It, it can, yep. So correct. one of the, one of the, one of the um, stories that you've done and one of the issues you're working on right now has to do with uh, 
the Amazon bid um, to the state of Minnesota, um, where your organization sought to get the information about what was actually in that bid um, to find out what the state offered Amazon. And from my conversations with you, um, that process, getting that information, has proved to be really difficult, that you got, a, you got several boxes of records from the state, but in terms of actually getting the bid, they've not provided you with the bid, claim that they don't have it. So can you talk a little bit about uh, that process, where things are at right now? And I think you're in litigation with the state right now. We are. To the extent yeah. that you can talk about that. Absolutely. Um, please do. Yeah, so this has been an interesting process. So uh, many media organizations became interested in this question of what did the state promise to Amazon to bring them here. It was ultimately unsuccessful. Amazon has decided they're not going to come to Minnesota. They still haven't decided where they're going to go. Um, but when it came time for, this, for people to put in requests to the state agencies about, or to DEED, and this, this, this specific state agency involved here, the Economic Development Authority. DEED, right. DEED, to ask them, what did you guys specifically a promise to Amazon, uh, they've offered kind of shifting uh, rationales for why they can't give it up over time. Uh, we were able to get a large volume of email correspondence about how they put the bid together. And if you look in the email correspondence, they'll tell some agencies that we can't give it up because of competitive reasons. Uh, they, uh, they ultimately told us that they did not have it. Um, now, the, when they initially made that representation to us, we didn't have any basis to contest it. Right. Um, because we hadn't received all their internal emails yet. We had a separate request for their internal correspondence about how they put it together. And now that you have that? Now that we have it, it's very clear that they had the bid in their possession. Um, you know, right, for instance, three days before we had filed our request, there's email correspondence between Deed and various legislative staffers who are asking, can we see what's in the bid? And they say, uh, yes, we're putting together the draft this weekend. Would you like to get together on Monday to go over the bid? And uh, there's also. And so to clarify, this was this is a, about Am I mean, we assume everybody in the public knows what this is, but this was Amazon's plan to create a second headquarters, promising employment of supposedly as many as 50,000 people, uh, where they were soliciting bids around the country, and Minnesota was one of several cities and communities to put together a bid. That's correct. And, and the, the the state went through the their local the local agency called DEED, the Department of Economic and yeah, Employment and Economic, Economic Development. Development. And um, that agency is telling you that even though they were involved with this whole process, they don't actually have the bid to share with you. Uh, because I know there were some disclosures that Amazon, you know, supposedly uh, you couldn't reveal some of the details. But now they've said they don't have it. So you, you are in litigation with the state? We're in litigation both with the state and with Greater MSP, which is a nonprofit economic development organization that partnered with the state to develop the bid. And that's mo made up mostly of Minnesota businesses, correct? Yeah, it's, okay. it's primarily Minnesota businesses and some government officials sit on, on that board. And have they, have they released, have they, have, are you still, have you received the bid information yet? Uh, no, we, we ultimately received all those emails about the internal correspondence, which as I've said, clearly shows that Deed had access to the bid. Uh, Greater MSP also clearly had access to the bid. Uh, Deed maintains that only Greater MSP has the bid. Uh, we've made record requests to them. Uh, they claim that they are not uh, required to give it to us, even though if there's a private entity that partners with a government entity to do government work, in this case, preparing the state of Minnesota's Amazon bid, they're covered by the Data Practices Act. Our, our open so why, why is it important that the public know what was in that bid, particularly since Minnesota is not a finalist. Why, why does it matter? Uh, what we're trying to avoid is this kind of process happening again in the future, um, it's particularly when the state is offering private monies, taxpayer monies, to a private entity in order to entice them to do something, to come here, to open a plant, et cetera. The public really needs to know uh, how their tax monies are being utilized. Uh, here, we don't really have any idea of what was the final package, what was the final offer. Uh, the state has released, you know, a summary uh, of what they claim is in there, but we don't know for sure because we can't see it. And that's, that's just not a good way to run these kinds of um, you know, operations. And so. would it be fair to say that um, you believe that the state, um, it, the, the, the claims that they're making for why they can't provide the data have been disingenuous 
that they're really stonewalling because they don't want the information to get out because they're, they would like to be able to do these things in private in the future and not be subject to the kind of scrutiny that you want to bring? Well, that's, our, that's our supposition. We're assuming that they, want, they don't want a precedent created where they have to give up this kind of bid data uh, when there's a public records request. And uh, we, we think it's absolutely critical that the public understands how they're utilizing tax dollars in these kinds of matters. Okay. Um, and then you, the, I, when I was reading, looking at printouts from your website about some of the cases, um, you are also currently in litigation uh, with the Justice Department. That sounds pretty remarkable for a small organization in, uh, based in St. Paul to uh, be suing the federal government and the Justice Department. So talk a little bit about how that came about and uh, where that matter is. Uh, sure. Just uh, today, as a matter of fact, uh, we have to file a status report with uh, the court out in the District of Columbia on that DOJ litigation. What is the status report? Uh, so the status report is once you're into litigation, uh, both parties have to come together and uh, set out a scheduling uh, order for the court. Exchanging documents and that kind of thing. Yeah. When, when are you going to file certain motions and those sorts of things? So that, that's due uh, at the end of the day today. So our attorneys are, are filing that today. Um, the whole case started... Um, well, if you go back to the original FOIA request, it goes back to March, excuse me, May of last year. So and what were you seeking from the federal government that they wouldn't provide? So if you look back over the last several years, um, and this goes back into the Obama administration as well, the Justice Department uh, has been more aggressive in trying to uh, use its legal tools to acquire information from members of the news media on a whole variety of, of, uh, sure. of issues primarily in the context of investigating whether somebody may have leaked like something whistle blow, or whistle there's a whistleblower. Where information is leaked to the media yeah. and they're, they're determined to find out who in the media got this information and who, who provided the leak, yeah, who, who, who was the source of the leak. Yeah, that's correct. And so okay. this Pretty heady stuff. Yeah, this kind of activity ramped up um, under the Bush administration after 9-11, uh, ramped up again during the Obama administration. And then because of the fact that President Trump has been so vociferously uh, aggressive uh, towards the media, we were also curious to see what his just Justice Department was doing in this regard. So we filed a request uh, that was asking for policies and legal memorandum and correspondence uh, from both the Obama and Trump administration about these kinds of matters. And so we, we uh, got to the point where we didn't uh, get anything back from the Justice Department of any substance and went to court in May of this year. And so we're now uh, just starting to get into the, pl the process of scheduling out when the motions will happen. If, if you're uh, just joining us uh, today uh, or right now, um, I'm talking with Matt Ealing of Public Record Media, an organization that uh, seeks to get public access to uh, information from state, federal, and local agencies as part of their mission to pursue transparency and democracy um, through freedom of information laws. So um, the, and, they have, the, essentially the federal government has, has told you that they don't have to provide you this information, correct? Or that they, or no. that they the, the information you seek uh, is not available? Um, the, the, there's a, num a number of different, what they call components, so offices within the Department of Justice that may have this kind of information. And so our FOIA request was targeted at all of those specific components. Uh, one component, the National Security Division, uh, said that they had not found any records they'd searched, um, but they said they only searched within their FARA office, which is a very, very limited office within NSD, National Security Division, that most likely wouldn't have these records because they're targeted at uh, foreign agent registration matters. Uh, so we appealed then saying to them, you know, you've searched the wrong area. You should expand your search uh, if you're going to find these records. And, uh, and we're certain there are records, um, especially from the Obama and Trump era, we know specifically because uh, the Obama administration had done a DOJ-wide review of these kind of policies. Gotcha. And so we know that there would be correspondence and memos from that. So this litigation is, from your, your original request to today is how long? Uh, so May of 2017 okay. to today, so almost a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. And have you... Have you successfully, is this the first time your organization has sued the federal government? Uh, we've sued uh, the federal government. I think this is our fifth time suing and the federal what, agency. And then the previous four times, did you have any luck getting the information you sought? Uh, we've sued DOJ twice before. Um, 
we, uh, we had to settle one uh, because they did not have, they claimed they didn't have documents and we couldn't prove they did not, right. so we settled that. Uh, the first time we sued DOJ uh, was a kind of a curious matter. We were looking for legal opinions about could they kill United States citizens in the United States with drones? Wow. Because they had released a legal opinion saying that they could kill United States citizens overseas with drones. So we were curious if that existed, uh, the same rationale existed here. Um, and they initially uh, said, you can't have that information, so we sued them. Uh, and then once we got into litigation, they said, oh, we don't have that information. Uh, and we couldn't prove that they, that they were lying to us, so we dismissed it, but we then continued litigation to get our legal fees because they had made a representation to us that, and then they switched it. And so that's uh, a pretty, it seems like that's a pretty wide mission to go from uh, information about an Amazon bid to uh, whether uh, the U.S. can legally use drones to kill people in this country, which is obviously of great concern, I think, to many people. Um, that's a pretty broad mandate. So how do you... Uh, is there a limit to sort of your mandate, or is it kind of whatever seems to really, uh, I mean, because it seems like there's a lot of national outlets might be covering that story. Why, why public records media? Why get into something involving the federal government that might involve a lot more expenditure when money is always tight for your organization? Why pursue that kind of litigation or that kind of request? Sure, in terms of uh, the, the question about why we go after certain topics, um, it, it comes down to um, what is happening in the in the country, you know, uh, that that we find to be of, of interest, or, or uh, we think there's an issue that could be highlighted more. Um, I personally am drawn to um, stories about the use of governmental power um, and governmental money to see how those things are utilized, both at the state and local level. Um, you know, Mike brings uh, a real interest in how uh, state money or state power and private money are cross-purposed by state agencies, um, so that's that's. But you one don't limit your you don't limit it. Well, it seems like more the more of your stories are really related to Minnesota, things that federal, state, or local agencies are doing that impact Minnesota. Whether I know we probably won't have time to get to it today, but you're also looking into story about this plan to bring the cyber security, the cyber warfare division to Minneapolis. Um, so the, the Minnesota, you know, limiting your scope to Minnesota um, seems like it's pretty much a handful just to do that. But you're, you're, um, you're also looking to, to, to uh, is that more on occasion or is that a regular part of, because it's, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big mandate. I mean, it, yeah. it seems like you could have an organization that just focused on, the military, you know, public records for the military. So to, to, from drones, I mean, Amazon's local, and I know you have a story about a Tesla crash in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. That all seems, um, you know, kind of within the purview, but it's a pretty big, uh, you're biting off quite a bit to take on the federal government when it's not a, say, a Minnesota matter. Yeah, we like to keep that flexibility um, just to be able to uh, to scale it to whatever is interesting to us at a time, either as individuals or as a board. You know, we've had folks on the board, you know, put in stuff that's not necessarily Minnesota related, uh, and it's it's nice to have that flexibility to be able to tackle those those different kinds of things. We did uh, we haven't done a story on this, but we did something completely unrelated to Minnesota in terms of records requests a couple of years ago. Uh, we put in a number of requests to try to get information about how self-driving car regulation is rolling out in different states. Uh, and we looked, we've looked specifically at Mountain View, California over the course of time to see what correspondence we're getting from Mountain View, California, which was one of, one of the early test sites for self-driving car technology. Is your, given, given all that you have on your plate and that you are someone who is doing this as kind of a sideline to your regular job, um, I'm sure it can get overwhelming at times. Do you have hope to kind of expand, get more people involved? Are there opportunities for people to get involved with the organization? Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, we, we have uh, help from volunteers uh, on a number of fronts, um, and we always have opportunities for them to plug in if they want. Um, one people, of people, you are a nonprofit, so people can donate. If, if, if our viewers find this kind of, uh, which I find very intriguing, um, 
this kind of work being done by a small nonprofit, they can go to your website and, and make a donation if they want to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. And the, the donations are primarily used for our legal work. Sure. Um, you know, the, uh, we have uh, some attorneys that we work with who have been very gracious with their time um, so, and give us a good rate, um, good. a discounted rate, but we but still want to... People would be supporting this, you know, it's journalism that you're, it's, it's kind of a unique space that you occupy. It's journalism and litigation and public access, um, which I guess most media organizations do, but you're also writing about your efforts to secure the information, which doesn't necessarily get covered as much. Yeah. Um, so uh, any, any, um, any stories coming up that, that just like you're ready to take on right now um, beyond what you've discussed on your website? Yeah, we have a, a number of requests that are in right now that could turn into stories. Uh, sometimes we'll just end up publishing raw records. Uh, sometimes we'll turn them into a story. We sure. are, we've got a whole bunch of records that are coming uh, from the Department of Human Services uh, in regard to the question of uh, how are state regulations for a particular kind of program that's mandated by the federal government to fight um, Medicare fraud, how are those going to be implemented in uh, the state of Minnesota? And uh, the interesting thing about uh, this particular, excuse me, this particular area of law is that um, the impacts are going to be felt uh, by people who are disabled, uh, because there are these federal, federal regulations saying that we're trying to fight Medicare fraud for recipients, including people who get uh, PCAs. We use, you know, they're using PCAs in their their day-to-day -day life, you know, largely people who are disabled. Um, and in order to document um, how those PCA services are being used, some states, to comply with this federal law, are photographing or using biometric technology to document uh, individuals' interactions with PCAs. Gotcha. And, a, and a lot of folks are real concerned about that. Well, yeah, and I think rightly, have a rightly whole so. Baby boomer generation that's aging out and their parents and the, the shortage of, uh, of personal care attendants and facilities and low, you know, not, not so much facilities, but just places for people to age out of their homes or to have care within their homes. These are all, you know, and they're also going to be pretty big budgetary matters. Yeah. So we've been talking uh, with, uh, with Matt Ealing, Ealing of uh, Public Record Media, which is a small nonprofit that uh, focuses on transparency issues and through the use application enforcement of freedom of information laws. Uh, that's, a, that's an area we could have a show on just, just on its own to talk about freedom of information, how you get information from the public agencies, local governments who are often reluctant to release it. Um, there are so many. There are so many issues um, in which that applies. So, um, the work that you're doing seems really valuable, and I'm I'm sure that for folks that are intrigued by this show, I hope you will follow up with Public Record Media, Public Record Media, to find out more about what they do. Um, their website it's public it's publicrecordmedia.com, correct? Uh, org. Publicrecordmedia.org. Sorry, of course, nonprofit, and uh, you also. Um, you tweet quite often about um, things, and you also have a Facebook presence. So um, to me, the amazing story about you is the work that you're doing, and a lot of people don't know about it. Um, and so hopefully, um, through this show and, and other appearances in the future, people become aware of your work and uh, can plug in in some way. Uh, any final thoughts for our audience? Uh, we always. Uh well, let me put it this way. There, there's one last piece of our mission we haven't talked about in that we train people how to use open records laws. So we have oh, trainings right. all Very over the state. Part. And uh, we'd encourage anybody who is interested in doing this to contact us if you want tips. Um, and we can give you a whole rundown on how to go about doing it. So all you citizen journalists out there who uh, may have your own presence, um, look for one of those workshops and uh, visit the website. You can learn more information about how you can uh, learn, out, learn how to be an investigative journalist on your own. Yeah. And um, great. Well, I really appreciate you coming in to talk with us today. And uh, thanks for being here. Uh, Matt Ealing with uh, Public Record Media. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.